Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hi, audience and listeners. This is James Kandasamy from Achieve Wealth through Value at Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I have Scott Myers, who's one of the leading authority in self-storage uh, investing education. So I'm happy to have him here. Scott owns almost more than 2 million square feet in self-storage space and across 7,500 units and is based out of uh, Indianapolis, right? So, hey, Scott, welcome to the show. Hey, James. Thanks for having me. How are you? Good. Very good. Very good. Thanks for coming on. I I, we, I really like to focus on multiple different asset classes. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, I'm a multifamily guy, but mm-hmm. I'm also a strong believer on the operator of any asset class, right? Mm-hmm. So if you find the right operator, even on the least popular asset class, mm-hmm. you know, if you find the right operator, you can definitely uh, make money out of it. Because there's some people who are really, really specialized in the asset class and you are one of them in self-storage. Mm-hmm. So, so I want to go... A, you know, deep into the self storage space is one of the uh, my uh, two favorite, right? Other than mm-hmm. multifamily, and mm-hmm. even though I don't really do self storage and uh, mobile mm-hmm. park, but I really like it just because of the asset class and mm-hmm. some of my research that I did on my own uh, in terms of like f- past fifteen years trend, right? So self storage mm-hmm. never went down on recession. That's not that's not data mm-hmm. from any any book or any uh, papers, mm-hmm. but I did my own uh, IRR report data, which is. Uh, Integra Realty Resources Report. So yep. is, that, is that correct? Fifteen. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, mm-hmm. good. <laughs> even though it, even though it was a bit hard to really uh, collect that data because it, it's, it's a bit sprinkled. It's, it's not mm-hmm. like a huge asset class. Self storage is not like a huge asset class like warehouse, industrial, mm-hmm. multifamily. It is right. it is an asset class, but it's a uh, small but specialized asset class. Scott, do you want to tell our audience something that I would have missed out about you? Hmm. <laughs> wow. Um, uh, well, I guess I got started in the business um, um, the way that many folks uh, do by um, investing in single family homes. And that, that okay. seems to be the easy entrance into to real estate. And then got into multifamily, um, investing in uh, office uh, buildings, warehouses, cold storage, okay. parking lots. And so, yes, uh, I, I too uh, have liked and invested in multiple asset classes in real estate. But you know, we, when we landed on self-storage, um, you know, the beauty of self storage is, uh, well, no tenants, no toilets and trash. And uh, although I made a lot of money in single family homes and apartments, um, you know, it's, you, you got to slug it out and, um, and get to that place where you can like yourself and like where we got to, where we had property management companies handling that and you get to that, you know, to the scale in which uh, that, that changes, but that's kind of a tough road to hoe. And, um, but once we get into self storage, not having those challenges, and then also when somebody doesn't pay you, you, you lock them out because the law allows you to do that. We have lien laws versus eviction laws. And if they don't, still don't pay, then you sell their stuff off to recoup your money. And so, you know, those factors combined, then um, we made that shift in 2005 to um, sell off our houses and our apartments and focus solely on, on self-storage. And that makes up 99% of our portfolio now. So what happened in 2005? Mm-hmm. Why was like, hey, I'm dumping all the other asset class. Self-storage is the way to go. What was... What was that transition? What triggered that? What was that aha moment? Yeah, when I bought my first self storage facility, that's when I got into the business. I've been investing since '93, and um, we had um, about 100 houses and about 400 apartments. And um, yeah, it just wasn't um, you know it didn't have the passive income that I wanted, nor the freedom at, at that level. And uh, began looking into self storage. And once we bought our first one, um, that one just you know on by, by every measure. Uh, outperformed um, the rest of our asset classes in terms of uh, dollar per square foot, just less management and headache and time and everything else. And so that's at the time we started divesting of everything else and and then uh, went on from there and growing to where we are now. So in 2005, that is like three years. Well, it's not three years. It's like one to two years before the peak of the market, Mm -hmm. right? Everybody was happy with buying houses. There's a lot Mm -hmm. of equity being built. Yeah. I'm sure doing crazy Mm -hmm. houses, doing crazy. uh, But Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not sure what was the state of self storage at that time. Was it a hot asset class that the equity is appreciating, mm-hmm. or was it like yeah. something that diamond in a rough at that time that you think that I want to do this? 
Yeah, you know, um, I don't. Th- it, it was still considered the the stepchild of commercial real estate or or all of real estate at that point. It just you know it wasn't sexy. There's still a lot of folks that just uh, they don't like it because it's niche. They don't understand it, or you know it's just a bunch of garages or sheds you know put out in a field as uh, people look at it. Um, so you know at that time when I began uh, looking into it, I was just uh, looking for an asset class that was uh, much simpler. Um, with with less competition, and then I could see it was on the upswing. And so, just when I started just digging into the industry and looking at the statistics on it, uh, it, it was pretty incredible. Um, it, again, in many ways, outperformed all other forms of real estate and uh, other asset classes, including the ones that I was heavily invested in. Um, so there, there, I think maybe because the, the, the lack of information also there, uh, was more intrigue on my end. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of folks that I knew that were investing in it. There wasn't a lot of, uh, there wasn't anybody, there wasn't a, you know, we have an education company now that was, uh, born out of me looking into this business at that point. And, you know, along the way, you know, we began teaching people and now we're, uh, my second company, our education company is the, the largest education company teaching people about investing in self-storage. And so, I think that's part of it. It was just it was kind of one of those uh, those unknowns. Uh, it was an untapped opportunity that m- many investors weren't familiar with or looking into. And so, you know, those are the types of things that I personally seek out. And so, from that from that standpoint, um, uh, once I dug in, looked at the numbers, and then bought and um, began uh, operating my first facility, you know, that I, I realized, uh, you know, this is uh, the road to to to, ho- to go down. And you know, yes, uh, money was um, inexpensive. It um, it was cheap at that time. Uh, the market was good. Banks were lending on. Uh, all types of asset classes, but self-storage I found was uh, even easier um, because of the fact that, um, as you just mentioned, it doesn't uh, go down in uh, a recession. It it is recession-proof and inflation-proof. When when things are bad in this country and people are downsizing and businesses are downsizing, self-storage actually benefits from that. So, you know, every recession that we've gone through since uh, the 70s, self-storage has benefited more than any other real estate asset class um, because of the nature of the business and what happens during a recession. Got it, got it, got it. So, so coming back to that 2005 when you started, mm-hmm. you said you did some research and you found some statistics. Can we go into that statistics and dissect a bit? What was that aha moment? That because yeah. it's very hard mm-hmm. to always find a new asset class, right? Like right now we are in 2020, right? I can. Mm-hmm. I, it's very hard for me to say this asset class is untapped, right? Unless yeah. right, mm-hmm. unless I, I know mm-hmm. someone is doing it, nobody knows about it and all that. So. Um, so I want to go back to your thought process and what was the data that you were available yeah, to you that was sure. the aha moment, the statistics that made you say, I want to go and try out this or do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, you, you look at, um, there was a study that was done by the uh, multifamily, let me see, multifamily rental housing commission, um, I mm-hmm. believe is, a, is the name of it at the time. It's been a while since I've been out of that. Mm-hmm. And then they looked at all the various um, asset classes in uh, rental real estate. And uh, they looked at uh, the amount of houses uh, that were available out there in uh, the marketplace. And there, were, there was roughly, I don't know, 13 uh, million, um, you know, again, give or take, uh, it's always changing uh, apartment or excuse me, single family rental units out there across the country that investors are investing in and everybody's investing in it. Oh. Um, there was roughly 16 million uh, apartment rental units, individual units, not complex, but individual units. Um, and there was, you know, multiple people that were obviously investing, including myself, in um, in multifamily. And I can go into any room and ask the people to raise their hands who's investing in single family uh, rentals and in any investment club that I was involved in or speaking at. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, eighty percent of the, the the hands in the room would go up if they're investing in houses. And for apartments, less than that, but still a, a number of them. Mm-hmm. And then when I ask how many people are investing in in self storage, nobody. I was like the only person at the time, you know, investing or nobody or even looking into it. Yet there's 24 million rental units in self storage compared to 16 million in apartments and 13 million in houses at the time. So um, I couldn't find anybody that was uh, that was investing in it or looking into it. Um, banks absolutely love self storage because it has the lowest loan default rate. Um, it was it's a fraction of the default rate for single family houses and apartment complexes. So you know at the time, both um, pre recession in that 2005 and 2006 time frame. The savings and loans, credit unions, um, smaller banks, um, they all wanted self-storage to add to their portfolio because they were portfolio lenders. They weren't packaging these up and selling them off to Wall Street. They were strong and, and they, they knew that they performed very well and they wanted them on their balance sheet when the next recession uh, hit. 
uh, then little did we know it did hit. And then 2008 and nine, um, I, I still had banks that were clamoring for self storage deals because self storage was going, you know, absolutely, you know, the hockey stick, um, as it does during a recession, doing extremely well, um, leasing up, um, outperforming everything else while the values of apartments and single family houses were, were all going down in, into the toilet. So, um, for those reasons, you know, that, that's why we begin looking into it. And that's the reason why we continue to do so uh, during the recession. And um, again, never say never, but um, uh, this is where I'm staying. I can't uh, find myself investing in anything else at this point. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a, it's an awesome mm-hmm. discovery that you did in 2005. Because I mean, up until uh, even like until four or five years ago, I don't think so self-storage is a well-known asset class. I mean, now I right. think... Mm-hmm. Now I think as a lot of people know about it. I mean, yeah. people are teaching, and there's a lot more podcasts, and people are trying to jump into mm-hmm. it, right? So, I mean, mm-hmm. am I right? Like four or five years ago, I don't think so. Self storage just yeah. I think <laughs> well, I, I think our organization has a little something to to do with that. Yeah, um, our yeah, education yeah. organization, but outside of that, I mean, it, it's Wall Street, and uh, you know, any you just you look at the stats. I mean, you, you start looking at uh, the asset classes in a comparison from you know the REITs down to the institutional investors. Um, year after year, consistently, self storage just out- outperforms uh, all of the commercial real estate. I mean, the numbers don't lie, and so uh, yeah, self storage has come to Main Street, and there's a lot of folks that are wanting to get in on it because it's performing so well. Yeah. So wh- how? I mean, I know one of the biggest thing that I realize about self storage is you know it's easy to manage. You know, there's a value mm-hmm. add because there's a lot of mom and pop, right? Am I right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and but you buy from uh, mom and pop, and you make it nice. You put U haul, and you make it a big business. And after that, mm-hmm. you probably want to sell it to the to the REITs. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether that's a that's a summary of the usual business um, plan. That, that that's the business model, James. Okay. Um, you know, okay. in, in the beginning, <laughs> um, you know, there was um, a, a lot more mom and pop facilities than there are um, today. But um, yeah, in the beginning, when we were starting out, looking at smaller facilities, but ones that are still able to be managed by a person or a management company. Uh-huh. And so, yeah, exactly that. Um, the the okay. mom and pops that, you know, they just took their hands off the wheel or they they fell behind in terms of technology or the marketing or even just, you know, the best business practices in the industry. You know, they've been doing well and making a whole bunch of money, you know, without trying very hard. And um, then we could come in and see the potential and the opportunity in, in the facilities. Um, and, and we would buy it when they're ready to sell at a fair price. And then uh, we would take it out up to the next level. So, it, you know, everything we've done has been value add. In terms mm-hmm. of turning the management around, uh, leasing up vacant units, adding profit centers, and then uh, adding more square footage. If we can build more buildings on that existing site or buy land next door or across the street, uh, we would do that. And then, you know, so now fast forward to the future, still looking at value add, um, mom and pops if we can, but uh, that could also be now conversions, uh, looking into other buildings to, to buy and convert to self-storage and then developing from the ground up. But yeah, everything we do has been uh, value add to make money for ourselves and our our, our investors. So uh, again, just like your model. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Self storage is very dependent on demand supply of an area, right? So mm-hmm. let's mm-hmm. walk through that process of underwriting a self storage mm-hmm. facility, which has already been built. I'm not well. We go build and later we go into develop, right? So we need right. build. So let's walk through the process. Mm-hmm. Let's say today I walk, I uh, drive by a place here in Austin, Texas, I mm-hmm. saw a self-storage for sale, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. how do I first, I mean, without talking about numbers, how do I analyze the location of it? Yeah. So yeah, yeah beyond the, the P&L of the numbers itself, um, the only way to build value in these is to lease them up. And if you can't lease it up because the market isn't good, then it doesn't do you any good to buy Correct. it. So Correct. Yeah, um, there's, you know, we look at the supply index is uh, what mm-hmm. we call it in our I- industry. Mm-hmm. And that just uh, matches up the amount of self-storage at square footage in a market. Where do you get that the, data? Um, so, well, there's a couple of different ways. Um, there's, there are, there is software out there that we can uh, buy. There's a couple of companies that we, we buy their data from and they'll draw a three mile ring or radio on that um, site and give you that information. Um, prior to that, we were still doing it on our own with Google earth pro looking at the facilities that are around it. And then we go to uh, esri.com or we can go to the, the local city data, the local websites for the chamber and find out. Uh, the population and then we do the math you know, pretty simple math in five minutes we can find out what the supply index looks like so we um depending upon the market the, the, it roughly falls into right around seven square foot per person is considered equilibrium in a marketplace Got it. so if we find that there's only four square feet of self-storage per person it's an undersupplied or underserved market if we're at 10 yeah you know we're going to go check those facilities and shop them and see you know are they full or do they have you know a number of units uh, uh, available some markets have a little higher demand depending upon, you know, if there's a lot of apartments, a lot of condos, track housing, 
um, colleges or you know a transitional type town, military, there's going to be a greater demand. So those supply index numbers may vary a little bit. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we're, we're kind of landing on somewhere right around that seven square foot per person that we know uh, w- that way we know whether it's either undersupplied or potentially oversupplied in a market. So how do you determine that? I mean, because the other uh, drawback to self storage is it's, it's very easy to develop, right? So let's say you you found that facility, you found like so four, uh, four person per square <laughs> feet, right? But mm-hmm. How do you make sure that someone else is not building in that area in the next one year after you buy it? How do you how do you mm-hmm. do the analysis that this new supply is not potentially may not be coming? Right. Mm-hmm. How do you well, how do you all, do that? First of all, uh, it is a little more uh, difficult to, to guard against that in Texas because you guys down there, you, you are the wild, <laughs> wild west. And, uh, oh, they, really? They approve, they, <laughs> zoning boards uh, approve everything, anything and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we are business friendly. <laughs> yeah, extremely <laughs> business friendly. Maybe too business, business friendly, like. yes. <laughs> so, um, well, you know, other developers, for the most part, you know, they're pretty savvy and they're not going to go in and build it without doing that same homework. And so, you know, we look to see what permits are coming down the pike. And so we're always keeping an eye on that throughout the process. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as we secure land or a building, if we're going to convert it, then up go the signs. It says the future home of. So, you know, even if other developers are looking around that market at at self-storage, you know, that may potentially ward them off or if they see, you know, the zoning and the permits and how many square feet that we're going to buy, they're doing their calculations. And and if, if, if our project... Um, the addition of 100,000 square feet will bring the market up to seven square foot per person, then, you know, the smart developer isn't going to go through all that risk and the, and the trouble of coming into a market that, and then their facility is going to be struggling during lease up and, and, and we potentially be in an oversupplied situation. Now, that's in a perfect world, right? Uh-huh. Um, so we still need to guard against that. And if we do see that some people are sniffing around, then we may approach them and just kind of you know, warn them against that. Uh, uh, there are some times when these developers... You know, usually they don't have private equity behind them or a bank um, or, you know, the need to go through a feasibility study or go in front of a lender to, to, to build their business model. Because if nobody's checking, you can't, I can't stop stupidity if somebody just has cash and they decide to build something. But for the most part, again, you know, there's, there's savvy developers like ourselves that aren't going to take a chance. They do the same bit of homework. And, you know, much like if I were to go into and find that same thing, we found a perfect spot, you know, the perfect building to convert. Um, but in our due diligence, we found that there's, you know, a, a U-Haul um, facility coming up or public storage or extra space, or even a, a, a national or regional player that's going to build 80,000 square foot. I'm not going to think that I'm better or that we're going to beat them to the market. That's, that's stupid. We're going to shoot ourselves in the foot we won't get the returns that we want. We'll have equity partners that are disgusted and we have banks that, that will either be disgusted if we go through with it or they won't give us a loan in the first place. So, so there's a natural, um, you know, there's some natural barriers um, called intelligent de- developers all looking at the same time, you know, mm-hmm. to keep that from happening. So again, that's in a perfect world, uh, but there are, you know, there is time to time uh, from time to time where you do have some folks in a, in a market that are enter and make it extremely competitive and difficult on everyone. Yeah. So there is no like one, well, it's a bit hard to really predict that, right? Who's going to build what, right? right. If, you're, if you're under contract, they, sometimes you just wouldn't know whether they're going to build one. End. Sometimes you wouldn't. That's why, you know, again, even prior to closing, I mean, that, that's one of our steps um, before mm-hmm. we go to the closing table the day before we're looking at the, you know, the zoning board and, and the office to see if any permits have been pulled or if there's anything going on that we didn't know about. Mm-hmm. Got it. Got it. And and um, sometimes it's also like sometimes your facility may not have certain features that the developer said, hey, I can bring in that feature plus whatever you have, right? Like like mm-hmm. so, uh, like cold storage, right? Uh, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes you have, you, you're you probably buying a deal which is just a normal storage, but somebody mm-hmm. else might come and say, I want to do normal storage plus cold yeah. storage, which makes mine more attractive, right? That can be a bit dangerous too, right? Absolutely. It could, well, it could be dangerous, but um, also, if anything, that may help um, because there's, you know, there's a place in the marketplace for non-temperature controlled, you know, less expensive storage, single story without all the amenities. You know, there's always a place for that. The folks are looking to store something uh, inexpensively. And even if uh, another facility uh, developer comes in and builds a, a facility um, that is, you know, three story and is all temperature controlled and, you know, security and, you know, everything, all the bells and whistles, a class A facility, um, there are people that are, will only store their things in that facility. And so, you know, okay. that, that, that does help um, to, get, you know, ward off a, an oversupply situation because there are somewhat segments uh, of the population. But um, okay. it, it's not exactly what you think the way you stated it, where people are going to say, well, I don't want to store my stuff over here in this non-temperature controlled. I want to put it over here. Um, they don't need to pay double you know, to just store some of their junk. I mean, their, okay. their treasures. Their, <laughs> their treasures, exactly. Yeah. So there's there's the degrees of treasures and that'll dictate, you know, the budget as to where they'll put their items. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Uh, 
um yeah it's it's that's i think that's one of the biggest uh a risk i would say right in self storage compared mm-hmm. to um like for example mobile home park a lot of people do not want mobile home park in their city so there's a high barrier to permits right. to build mobile home park right mm-hmm. whereas apartments and self storage always have you know the supply things i mean in any asset class there's there's always a supply concern yeah. that anybody at can come at the end of the day the it's it's a gotcha in any form mm-hmm. of real estate is you just got to do your due diligence period yeah yeah correct the other thing on on self storage that you know i found out that um that that it's not a, it's just a different way of financing it right like you don't get a lot of non recourse on compared to apartment i mean i mean there's pro and con in both right so right how do you uh, do you do recourse loans or do you non recourse or it doesn't matter really in the yeah, well, storage well of course we don't like you know if, if we don't have to do a recourse uh, we you know we'd rather not um again the good news with self storage is we find a lot more non recourse funding available out there just because uh, the asset class is less risky you know the loan default oh, really? is, the, is the lowest um, compared to all other forms of commercial real estate so um there's a lot more lenders that are uh, willing to do non recourse just because you know the the asset class doesn't fail very often okay okay i was thinking maybe i was maybe the sources that i got was a lot of recourse but i think anything at lower leverage you should be able to get non recourse so is that yeah, is that sure. really common for yeah, low yeah. okay mm-hmm. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. And uh, what about the uh, in two thousand five? I'm going to go back to two thousand five because yeah. you know, you discovered an asset class that not many people mm-hmm. discover, right? So yeah. if I want to re, if one of our listeners want to recreate that your success, they have to discover that asset class, right? So you found this self storage. How did mm-hmm. you do your underwriting? Because you know there's no one there to teach you how to underwrite this investment, right? This yeah. is asset class, yeah. right? Well, so it started with um, you know the the Excel spreadsheet that I used to underwrite my apartment complexes. You know, so at the end of the oh, day, okay. it's still commercial real estate, and you Absolutely. income minus expenses and NOI and a cap rate. Um, yeah. So then, what I had to do is um, I, I spent time with a consultant in the industry who does feasibility studies, and uh, paid him to spend time a day with him to. Um, not only visit his uh, facilities that he owned, those that he managed for somebody else, but then also spent a fair amount of time um, underwriting and understanding, you know, hey, every line, well, understanding all the line item expenses in a self storage facility and how to account for that and what those industry averages are just to, to be able to see, you know, in a self storage facility when I look into it, hey, is this above or below average? Or, you know, are they are feeding me a line here? Is this, you know, truly the expense uh, you know, or, or where, where should I be as a baseline? So, um, and, and again, as, as you know, you know, underwriting for any asset class, apartments, self storage, mobile home parks, you know, there's an art and a science to it. You know, Absolutely. here's the underwriting for the lenders and, and the industry averages, but everyone is different. And then you also have to, you know, we look at three sets of numbers, you know, here's where it is right now. You know, we, we stress that NOI and send that back uh, with our offer to the seller. Then there's our, our 30 day, you know, here's what it's going to look like the day that we buy it or 30 days after we make some changes. And then here's what it's going to look like in one year from now. And then obviously our projections after that. So when I look at those three numbers for an acquisition, um, you know that's going to tell me where you know where we're going to land in a purchase price and what this uh, facility is going to look like. And then obviously um, five years, hopefully there's a, a large value add down the road. Uh, but learning it is um, you know again like anything else. I, I, I hired experts, I paid those folks, and then did a lot underwrote a lot of facilities. And then you just you know you kind of begin to, to build up that experiential math in your mind. You know when you know when you begin to start looking at these, you know what it's going to look like. Was it easy to get deals in 2005-2006? Easier then than it is now. Um, yeah, <laughs> Cat, cats out of the bag. It's a hot asset class. So there's a lot of competition, and and right now, I mean, from from where we're sitting right now at the time of this podcast, you know, there's uh, we, we've had a bull run. Uh, interest rates have been low, and and so if those sellers uh, and cap rates are low, so if those sellers were in a position to you know sell for whatever reason to retire, or if they just had built value in it, they were going to trade in, trade up, you know, they've sold off in the past few years because uh, we are at the top of the market. So the, the ones that are out there, they're, and there's still opportunities out there, don't get me wrong. Um, you, you just need to look a little harder and look at the value to be created in those uh, in the future, not just uh, immediately. And uh, there are other folks, uh, you know, it is competitive. There are other folks that have sent letters and mailers and knock on their door as well, asking them to sell their, uh, their, their self-storage facility. So um, but at, you know, at the end of the day, I'll, I'll, I'll say this uh, to you and your listeners, the same as I do to our students at our events, um, hard work wins in the end. And, you know, just going out to, and no offense against LoopNet or any of the other uh, websites out there, we're just going to LoopNet and doing a few searches and then giving up is, is not a strategy. Um, you do need to send the mailers out. You need to knock on doors, do Google searches, you know, get your own database and, and work it and continue to contact the folks in your market. 
you know, until they tell you to stop or they sell you your facility or they die. One, one of the three. Uh, but if you keep after it, you'll, you'll find deals. Our, our students are finding deals. We're finding deals all, um, all the time. Um, not as easily as 2005, as you mentioned, but um, they're out there. Do you buy deals from, I mean, not you, I mean, um, do you, do common people buy deals through brokers as well on self storage? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the large brokerage firms, um, you, you know, all the players, um, they, um, most of the large ones have a self storage division or an arm to them. Okay. And then there's other commercial uh, brokers that specialize in industrial and in storage. Um, and then there's also, I mean, you'll find from time to time, I mean, we look all over the place and our search for facilities. And so you'll see them listed by business brokers as well. Um, because there's a lot of mom and pop owners that when they're getting ready to sell, they, they look at their facility as not as commercial real estate, but they look at it as they're selling their business. And so they, they may list it themselves on one of the, the small business brokerage, uh, excuse me, small business uh, for sale websites or contact a small business broker and they'll put it on one of the small business brokerage websites as well. So a number of uh, avenues and places to be able to, to look for self storage that uh, comes available for sale. Got it. Got it. What about the... Um depreciation and tax benefits in self-storage. How does that play out compared to like apartments? Yeah. Cost segregation is our friend. Um, we, we, we um, apply cost segregation immediately to these projects, especially when we're buying them and building them. And so, you know, everything else uh, is the same and applies, you know, for tax purposes with the added benefit of, um, you know, we can write so much off in, in cost segregation um, because of uh, the way that they're built from the walls, the doors, uh, you name it, the, the lion's share of the facility can be uh, written off um, using cost segregation. So it's a very advantageous. Uh, but also going into these projects, um, it's much easier because self-storage really it started out as a land uh, land play and kind of a land bank where, you know, years ago, back in the 50s and 60s, people would put up these um, storage buildings, um, buy, buy five acres way out on the edge of town, um, even beyond the path of progress, build some buildings um, and, and rent them out um, to pay for the property taxes until all the growth came that way and then they would knock them down and sell them off to somebody else or build something else. Well, um, now self storage is, is the highest and best use, but when we go to buy these, uh, we will buy them uh, with two separate purchase agreements, one for the land and then one for the business and the buildings. So from that standpoint, um, we can lower our, our tax basis when we go into these projects because uh, the, the assessor's office recognizes that is that um, it, it, it is a land bank. It is uh, uh, these are buildings that can be um, taken down, and the business it's only a single use. You know, when you when you have a self storage facility and you see all those doors, and it's one use. That's it. Uh -huh. um, so it's really easy to go in with two purchase agreements, and then also win that uh, uh, that battle or the negotiation with the tax assessor as to uh, the reason why that um, we have it assessed at, at, for the land and the building separately. Interesting. Interesting. What about your funding sources? Do you, did you do, I am presume you do syndication nowadays, right? Correct. So a lot of your mm -hmm. deals. So did you guys do that in 2005? No, we didn't. Um, that, that was our partners. And, um, you know, a few folks that would come along um, side of us uh, that had some retirement funds and they would be partners in the, the deals. Um, we did do some, uh, some PPMs, some syndications, but just with um, family, you know, true fam you know, friends and family at that point, just one or two people. Mm -hmm. uh, but at that time, we were still using uh, local lenders, um, credit unions, savings and loans, community banks, 75% LTV, and then we would bring the down payment uh, or our partners would, uh, or we would do uh, a lot of seller financing. Uh, those mom and pops, uh, the owners, they would have uh, built these years ago or um, bought them years ago and they paid it down and paid it off and, and they didn't want to pay capital gains taxes. And so they would stay in the deal and sometimes you know stay in for the amount of the down payment. And then we would just bring a small amount to the closing table and, and layer that on top of a, a 75 or 80% LTV loan. Uh, these days, we're using mostly the SBA for our underlying debt, um, but also still credit unions and, and, and local banks. Um, but then, yes, yeah, syndicating the rest of the funds and um, setting up uh, Reg D filings, uh, 506Bs and 506Cs um, to layer the money on top of an SBA loan or, or a traditional lender. Got it. Got it. And how did the uh, negotiation terms have changed since 2005 to now? I mean, mm -hmm. in terms of like how many days you have for due diligence, mm -hmm. you know, um, how many day one had money, you know, how, how does how is it then and how is it now? I, I don't think that that has changed uh, too much, James. Um, maybe maybe okay. we asked for a little bit more. And so we're getting a little bit longer time frames just because we were too afraid to ask back then. Um, mm -hmm. But it, pretty standard. I mean, we try to a traditional existing facility should be up and down in 90 days. So, you know, we give them 10 days to give us their books and records, maybe two weeks. Um, at the end of 30 days, we'll have our discovery period and look. And then uh, we may have another 30 days um, uh, once we have our financing in place for them to do third parties and then closing another 30 days later. 
Um, again, we can get up and down in, in 90 days, sometimes less than that. Now, if we're, if we're doing an SBA loan, um, they just, it takes longer. It just flat out takes longer. And so you know, we start at 90 days and we ask for an extension for, uh, for till 120 or sometimes 120 and an extension to, to, to 150 days just because that process lasts a little bit longer. And if we're raising private equity, we'd like to have a little longer runway to be able to do so. So as long as the seller agrees to that, then um, you know, those timeframes are a little bit longer with the SBA. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, in the apartment world, we are saying day one, hard money, you know, five days <laughs> due diligence. And yeah. you know, the potential of you making mistakes is very high, right? And uh, you have... Uh, yeah, we people. just won't do it. If I, I won't put ourselves in that position. Um, you know, you yeah. take away all leverage and, and, and ability to um, perform. And yeah, we just... Yeah. And, and it's a one-year lease. And I mean, there's, there's pro and cons and everything, but it's just mm-hmm. become so hot now. The, mm-hmm. the sellers are asking for sellers and brokers asking for you know, crazy terms nowadays, right? So yeah. happy to know that in South Storage, it's not that bad yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hopefully, it's never yep. get there, but... Well, but, some uh, some are. I mean, we, we've got some crazy, you know, terms and we just, you know, they want to see proof of funds and uh-huh. they say, well, we got to get a deal first. I can't, you know, no lender is going to prove anything until we have a contract and I can't right. take anything to my private equity partners until yeah. we know what we're paying for and do some due diligence. And so... You know, things like that are just, you know, that's some of the, the ridiculous things that we just will always deal with. Um, but we just can't, you know, we can't perform under those terms. And so, you know, we've, we've got terminology in, um, that we use to combat that. And then also our relationships and then our track record of performance that they shouldn't have to worry. And, you know, our money will go hard when we're done with due diligence. We'll make it short. But, you know, we got to take a look under the hood. We can't, <laughs> we're not going to give you $100,000 non-refundable, um, you know, deposit on this thing and, and, and without a chance of looking at your books and records and inspecting the, the, the property. So, yeah, you'd yeah. be surprised to see how many people are paying like half a million dollars without looking, looking at the property right now for you know, an apartment. Well, deals, right? well, what, what is the difference between if I give you a dollar for earnest money, or if I give you a million dollars for earnest money and the, and the purchase price is a million one mm-hmm. if at the end of due diligence, there's something I don't like and your numbers are fudged then I'm getting it all back, whether it's a dollar or a million bucks. So, I don't know yeah. why everybody is still making a big deal out of this, you know, that large earnest money deposits. Um, it just yeah. doesn't make any sense. It's all coming back. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, I think it's just the way the market is so hot right now. So I know. And it weaves well. people out. If, if you have the ability to do that, then, you know, they know that you're yeah. a more serious borrower or, or buyer if you have that money. So I, I get it, but yeah. It just put you a lot, a lot more on, on a risky side, right? So Correct, yeah. And what about... Uh, how do you do your offerings? Is it like deal by deal or you do a fund basis kind of thing? Yeah, we, we don't have a fund yet, James. And we're, we're heading towards that. Um, okay. I think when, you know, when we see signs that the market is going to turn and there's more uh, opportunity to buy existing facilities where the, you know, the owner hasn't done a good job and it's time to refinance at higher interest rates and lower LTVs, we'll, we'll look to do a fund. But right now, everything is a single asset, single entity LLC. And we do a capital raise um, for each project right now. What is the average raise that you're doing? I mean, I'm sure it depends on the size. And- it, it does. I'd say we're probably falling in that uh, $3 million mark or so. You know, okay. Some of them are as low okay. as 500000 but most of them and others are 3.5, 3.7. So I'd say, yeah, somewhere around the $3 million mark is what we're raising. Do you see a lot of passive investors interested in, in investing in self storage? Oh my gosh, more than we can pl- uh, supply deals for. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, I mean, they're 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 just like investors, you know. If they're they're just doing it passively, everybody wants a, a piece of self storage right now. So we, we're just mm-hmm. trying to supply the deals to them. What would you invite uh, advice to a passive investor who's looking at a deal, right? A generic deal. What are the steps that a passive investor should take mm-hmm. to analyze that deal at at very high level for passive yeah. investing? Yeah, well, I think they need to learn about the asset class um, first of all. So, you know, however way, shape, or form they can um, do to educate themselves in the market space and, oh. and understanding self storage is, is helpful. Uh, but again, in the beginning stages, um, yeah, they need to look at the at the sponsor and um, you know what is the sponsor's experience level and have they successfully purchased, created value, and exited? And you know, did they hit their marks in terms of the projections that they had made to you know their investors in that project or those projects? You know, how well did they perform? Did they always fall short? Did they exceed the projections uh, going into those? Um, or are they are they still untested? This is their first deal, or they bought and they're building value, but they haven't exited and created any value for their folks. So I, I think uh, that's that's probably the main thing is you, you need to vet your sponsors very well. 
Got it. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, the operators and the sponsor are the biggest mm-hmm. sure. factor in any deal, right? So they're, they're they are the factor. Yeah, they are the factor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> correct. They are the investment return, I guess. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> correct. Yeah. Right. So that's awesome. So, what would you tell a newbie who's want to start in a self storage investing uh, as an active sponsor? What uh, as a sponsor, as the primary? Yeah. 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 Correct. Uh, again, go out and, and, and learn the business. Um, have somebody come alongside of you, or at the very least, um, you know, check your underwriting and you know your your due diligence in self storage is um, maybe even more so important to look at the market and um, the the supply index that we discussed. You know, if you're if you're a value add investor and you're looking to take a facility from sixty percent occupancy up to eighty five percent occupancy, you need to be sure that you can do so because if you shop the competition all around in a five mile radius and they're all at sixty percent, then guess what? You, mm-hmm. The market is stabilized, and so is your facility. You're not going anywhere, mm-hmm. so you need to, to to look into the market and make sure that you can uh, raise occupancy, raise rates, or there's growth coming, or some compelling reason um, to, to allow you to hit your marks if you're going to create value in it. Uh, but then get real good at underwriting and get some help or assistance or even hire somebody to to look over those numbers because in commercial real estate, um, you know, a, a ten thousand dollar mistake in underwriting is uh, is more than a hundred thousand dollar mistake in valuation at today's cap rates. It's more like one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and it's real easy in a, in a five million dollar deal to miss ten thousand dollars in expenses and um, you know just shoot yourself in the foot to the tune of a one hundred twenty thousand uh, dollars or more. So. Um, get real good at that side. And then, um, yeah, hit the ground running with um, a property management company um, if you can, or make sure you hire a rock star manager to manage the facility. Um, do not hire um, the gal at Great Clips because she's nice and you like the way she cuts your hair. Yeah, <laughs> she's exactly. Not the person, <laughs> she's not the person to um, manage your $1 million investment. You wouldn't put her in charge of a $1 million stock portfolio. This is no different. So, you know, do your due diligence and then make sure that you're managing that asset once you buy it um, to the best of your abilities to create the value in it. So, I mean, there's lots of others, but those, yeah, those are the main. How critical is asset management and self storage? Well, so we're on the same page. I mean, uh, there, there's property management, which is huh? um, that that encompasses uh, the, the marketing and the bookkeeping uh, of the asset itself. There's correct, the, the on site payroll, the person behind the counter. You know, we look at asset management as uh, managing the the investor or the Correct. overall investment, meaning the private equity piece. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, we take that very seriously. And we've um, we didn't do such a good job of that in the beginning, and um, we didn't realize how much our our investors wanted to be communicated to uh, by sending out the regular reports. And we thought that monthly reports of the, the performance and a quarterly webinar was enough, and they they want more than that. And um, K one's uh, on time, obviously, but just you know, timely. And over communication to our investors is is key. Getting those K ones out on time, um, but then in an organized fashion. You know, we we've now taken it to the next level. And last year, um, we uh, we have a portal now. We built out a portal, so you know we look like the the big guys. I guess we're getting as big as the big guys now. But you know, we have you know we look like Fairway Capital when you log into our portal, or you know Realty Mogul, or you know Crowd Street Fundrise. Um, the reporting and, and the information that we have is every bit as good as uh, as the big guys. So. Um, never underestimate that or else, um, you know, you're, you'll spend a lot of time answering questions um, from them with phone calls and emails. If, and you wouldn't have to do that if you just communicate with them regularly. And they'll keep coming back to you as long as you perform and you've been easy to work with and communicate with them. And they will invest in your next deal and your next and your next. Yeah, yeah. I have a portal as well. And my investors love it too. Mm-hmm. Everything is yeah. centralized and all that. I think the you other, have to have it. <laughs> the other asset management part that I'm... I'm pretty well was is more on the the strategy to increase the rent to keep on uh, making mm-hmm. sure that they are having the business plan being executed right yes. like, for example in your case you need to get a u-haul uh, company service agreement i mean how mm-hmm. how complicated is that uh, mm-hmm. business plan execution uh, it, it, it's key. That's another layer that we've added. Um, you know, it's it's one thing to um, vet the property management companies and interview and make sure that you get a great property management company in place to manage the the, the facility for you. Um, but at the end of the day, you and I both know nobody cares one percent as much about uh, your yeah. facility and your apartment than you. Yep. So Absolutely. for that the degree, we've added a layer. We've added another person who manages the management company, and, and it oh. may sound like overkill or redundancy, but you know, here's the plan, and they're meeting with the property management company on a monthly basis, saying, you know, here, here, here's what we set out to do um, to make this thing perform. So, what have you done to add a tenant insurance program, and have you raised rates by this percent, and and how has the revenue been affected? What's the marketing plan this month, and is it in line with this quarter? So, 
you know, they, um, we don't just, it's not a set it and forget it, um, business by any stretch. Um, yeah, we need to manage the management companies and drive the performance and then drive the value. Got it. Got it. Got it. And, and at high level, what is uh, a stabilized self storage cap rate that's being sold in the market right now? Of course, it all depends, um, you know, and, class and A, it, class B, class C, and, you know, and, and what market you're in. But, um, okay. you know, gosh, when everything was hot, you know, the, the uh, when I say two years ago, the class A institutional grade facilities, uh, they were selling uh, below a 4% cap rate. Uh-huh. I think those have now stabilized um, closer to, to 5 to 5.5% cap rate. Um, the, the projects that we're, um, looking to produce to, to the REITs, um, or to the national players to buy their class A facilities. And, um, you know, we're looking at a, an exit strategy of six. Uh, we certainly could uh, push to get a little bit uh, lower than that, but, um, you know, that's, that's how, where those are trading class B seven, seven and a half cap rate. And then, um, uh, a C obviously depending upon the, uh, you know, occupancy in the market and how rural it is, you know, seven and a half and above. And is it based on uh, year built for the classes? I mean, all things considered, um, yeah, there's, um, you, you know, first generation, whether it has climate control, you know, what's the market, is it rural, you know, rental mm-hmm. rates, how is it managed? Is it big enough to be managed by a management company? Um, is it big enough to be managed by a REIT, um, you know, security system in place, regular, you know, what, what is the rental rate history? Has it been spiking, population spiking in the market, um, you know, path of progress, you know, all those things. So it's not only where it is today and where it's been, but also uh, the upside in it as well. And what, we, what we've seen, James, is these things perform, you know, you, we, we put still more blinders on and self storage than we do with uh, apartments or some of the other asset classes. Uh, when we look at it as a performing asset, let's mm-hmm. look at the underlying, you know, where we're going to take it. It doesn't have to be beautiful. Um, you know, we can get these class B facilities that are operating very, very well and, and cap, they'll trade at a cap rate that is closer to the class A facilities, more of the institutional grade, just because it's so predictable. And, um, you know, we, we know what's going to happen in the marketplace. And if it's a high barriers to entry, it's going to be a, a, you know, a solid investment that we can hang our hat on without too many variables. Um, what we have in a, you know, apartments, housing, you know, dental offices, um, you know, mobile home parks, there's always going to be somebody that's going to be bright and shiny. Uh, nicer and people want to live there or they want to office out of the nicer places. And so you'll see the, you know, first generation or older generation get affected by that. But self-storage is, it's, it's largely excluded from, from that phenomenon. Got it. Got it. Got it. Well, awesome, Scott. So why not you tell our audience how to get hold of you and your education platforms, of course. Yell really loud right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to get all of you i guess <laughs> <laughs> no selfstorageinvesting.com selfstorageinvesting.com okay. um is uh, is the way to get in touch with me and there's uh, lots of free resources on the industry if you're looking to get into it or just learn more about it um, on the passive end um uh, yeah that is uh, the best place and the best resource uh, to start okay Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on to the show. Uh, I, pleasure, you are the only guy, I think, uh, yeah, you're the only one who have talked about self-storage in this uh, show. And I like to focus on a lot of asset classes, even though we have a lot more multifamily guys, but I really, really mm-hmm. like talking about different asset class, how it's being sure. written. Mm-hmm. Because I believe, as I said, you know, there's a potential in all asset classes. So as long as you find sure. the right operator in that mm-hmm. asset class, who are the best asset class in that asset class. So Agreed. thanks for coming in. My pleasure, James. Thank you. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to learn even more, check out James's free audiobook. It's the audio version of his best selling book on passive investing. You can get the audiobook completely free, along with other valuable resources, by visiting www.achieveinvestmentgroup.com forward slash free audiobook. Also, be sure to join our Facebook group too. To find it, just do a Facebook search for Multifamily Investors Group. Thanks for listening. Join us again for another episode next week. See you then.